Alrighty, so let's continue on this Judith Butler train and finish up undoing gender. Now this is going to start from chapter 5 titled, Is Kinship Always Already Heterosexual? So kinship in this context, Butler defines as the birth, death, child-rearing relations of emotional dependency and support, generational ties and illness, including other things, all of which is taken care of in a kind of family setting or in a kind of kinship setting. So she is asking of these kinds of relations, if they are always already, that is, if they are always um, heterosexual, that is, do they all kind of galvanize or cohere around the idea of a man and a woman coming together as being the kind of um, locus of the household or of the family dynamic. Now, obviously, this assumption for Butler portends an exclusion. That is, it kind of sets the stage for the exclusion of difference, the exclusion of different ways of organizing family relations. So one such example would be like how in some communities, the idea of the nuclear family isn't quite as strong as it is in others. So in some cases, you know, there's more of a community uh, background behind child rearing. There might be more people in the extended family that play a more direct role than in a lot of the nuclear family settings. There might be non-monogamous types of child rearing. There might be, you know, divorced parents or uh, same-sex parents or other kinds of like queer identifying parents. Now, as a kind of experiment, you know, to illustrate this, you can go onto Google Images and just type in family. And the results that you'll get are mostly gonna be of a man and a woman together with kids. The, you know, the 2.3 kids or the 2.2 kids. Uh, and that is supposed to be what makes up a family. So obviously there is within our kind of cultural zeitgeist, that is our cultural uh, imagination, our kind of cultural landscape, there is an assumption that the family is comprised of a man, a woman, and kids. Then a, maybe a dog. So of course marriage serves a pretty instrumental role in maintaining this dynamic. So even those bodies that don't necessarily fit the mold, take gay couples, for instance, that have adoptive children or children they've adopted, or maybe they didn't adopt. Maybe it's their, their biological kids. I shouldn't have assumed that. Uh, it could be their biological kids, whatever. You know, they don't necessarily fall into, under the, the umbrella of what is considered, you know, the quote unquote normal family. Uh, marriage that binds, you know, all these different settings together, that is, non-normative bodies or non-normative couples is something that Butler wants to kind of interrogate. So obviously in the United States and Canada and in a lot of places in the world, there is a debate around gay marriage, which is in my mind a ridiculous thing. Um, it should obviously be <laughs> legal, but uh, anyways, for some reason we have to entertain people who think otherwise. Uh, so this is to say, in, in, in kind of Butler's mind, that our it shouldn't the debate shouldn't be whether or not we are for or against gay marriage. It is it is that we should be interrogating why it is we want marriage to kind of extend itself to all these other bodies, all these other kind of couplings. So if we are able for Butler to get at the problem of marriage itself we will be able to mount a much more effective challenge to this oppressive normative structure of the nuclear family. Whereas if we just, you know, make gay marriage uh, normalized, then we are going to see a similar cycle reproduced in that it's going to foreclose the possibility to engage in other forms of kinship relations, like the ones I've already mentioned, like non-monogamous ones, like those that include, you know, relatives, those that that um, involve like uh, more of a community um, component to one's own relationship and one's relationship with one's kids. So as long as we place such an emphasis on marriage, what we are doing is really giving our, or giving the state the, the, the power to control and to determine what kinds of relationships, what kinds of relations are permitted. So for Butler, there are kind of two motivating factors that have placed such emphasis on state authority, and that is the idea of cultural authority and natural authority. 
So to look back to what we talked about in the first episode with uh, the work of Claude Lévi-Strauss, what we can see is an, uh, essentially an effort to inscribe upon human filiation, that is upon human um, connections, human, human forms of relations and, and kinship, uh, to inscribe upon that a natural quality. And then, so that's the kind of natural component. And then looking back again at Lacan, Jacques Lacan, we see an effort to kind of maintain a cultural authority through the symbolic. You know, the thing that wasn't considered really natural, but was considered universal. It's something that exists within culture. So, according to these kinds of two approaches, there are natural laws, there are symbolic or cultural ones, and these things kind of determine why we act the way we do. So, if we remember the incest taboo, we know that there is a a desire for exogamy. That is, going outside of one's own immediate family to um, form relations, to form sexual bonds with people outside of the family. But then there are other rules that say, but don't go too far. Don't Don't go too far as to mingle uh, or to or to participate in miscegenation, which would be like interracial breeding. So there's both an, a, a kind of motivating factor that tells people that they cannot engage in incest. At the same time, however, there's a motivating factor that says you have to remain somewhat within your kind of closed setting so as not to stray too far from the pack. Otherwise, you know, you, you might risk like diluting your your... Uh, your blood or your kind of identity, your racial identity. So you have the natural, that is the incest taboo on one side, and then the cultural one, that is the kind of foreclosure of possibility, that is the maintenance of a kind of cultural identity that is absolutely linked with one's racial identity. And of course, you know, these ideas come out of a very narrow anthropological kind of understanding of the world, one that, you know, takes one culture and says, wow, here is the truth of all culture, even if that one culture was read um, accurately, which which has certainly been uh, contested. But Butler says, and uh, she's quite right, it is this kind of steady balance between a natural law and a cultural law that sets the stage for what we can know as society or culture itself. So both an, uh, uh, there's uh, both a drive to move with, for, away and a drive to remain somewhat consistently within. And of course, then this idea of culture is inextricably linked to heterosexuality. For within either of these perspectives, within, whether it be it that of Lévi-Strauss or Lacan, everything gravitates around the heterosexual couple. Now, having kind of set this out, illustrated this, Butler is going to ask kind of preliminarily, and this is going to come out in the next chapters more in more detail, she asks if it's possible for the idea of Oedipus, that is the Oedipus complex, or psychoanalysis maybe more generally, is it possible that it can be rescued from a kind of compulsory heterosexuality, a kind of all, you know, implicit assumption about heterosexuality, or is it always doomed to that and will, and will always therefore be um, a kind of archaic uh, theory about human relations. Now, as I said, this comes out more in the next chapter, so we'll just jump right into that, the next chapter and the ones that, you know, follow. And here we enter chapter six, titled Longing for Recognition. And here we're going to get more into Hegel, which I'll try and explain as best I can uh, so that this makes sense. And we did it a bit in the first chapter, but this is where it really kind of picks up. So here in this chapter, Butler comments on the work of Jessica Benjamin. I think that's how you pronounce it. You know, the Walter Benjamin screws it up whenever I, I always think of that pronunciation and it's obviously wrong and sexist, but it's something that just happens. Um, so uh, Butler here is commenting on Jessica Benjamin's work on recognition. So this recognition takes its cue from Hegel, but it is different in that it, apparently, doesn't rely on negation. Instead, it tries to maintain a kind of healthy equilibrium between someone and an other, where both differences and similarities are accentuated. Of course, 
uh, for Benjamin, um, there is a risk where uh, one might overcome the other. That is, where a subject might recognize another and be kind of fondly curious of their differences while also recognizing their similarities. There is in that encounter the possibility that one will try to overtake, control, dominate the other. And for Benjamin, this possibility is held in check through therapy. So therapy is what maintains a kind of healthy recognition. So to kind of comment for a moment on Hegel, this is coming out of his, uh, mostly his ideas from the phenomenology of spirit, but also his, his ideas from the philosophy of history, in which he says, that is in the philosophy of history, it is our duty, or as I guess our duty, as humans to stare the negative, that is whatever is not us, whatever is different from us, to stare it in the face and kind of work with it, to make sense of it, you know, so we can change and there's always a kind of implicit change in, implied within that meeting of an other. So you encounter the other and it causes a kind of disturbance within yourself that changes you as well as changes the other because they are also undergoing this kind of process. And this is how history moves. History is the movement of con that is movement brought about through conflict. Because if we didn't have perpetual conflict, that is, if we didn't have a perpetual or continual, a repeated kind of um, encounter with things that were different from us, then we wouldn't change at all. We need to, in Hegel's mind, embrace experience. We need to embrace our encounter with things that we do not understand, things that we do not know, so that we can constantly be moving. Otherwise, we're going to be what he calls a kind of lifeless, uh, immobile mass. Now, to return for a moment uh, uh, to what Jessica Benjamin is doing here, she's saying that there is implied a kind of recognition in this encounter, but she wants to maintain it so that one doesn't to reiterate, overcome the other. And therapy is the force that does that so that, you know, they, there's still a kind of comfort maintained on either side where people can still be comfortably within their own selves without the risk of being totally decimated, totally destroyed. So Butler has a problem with that. Butler's problem with that is that it's too neat. It's too clean. For her, in her reading of Hegel, there is always destruction going on. There are always moments where the self and the other are being stripped of their identity, being stripped of their selfness, and brought into something new. So in Hegel's, uh, in Hegel's work, The Phenomenology of Spirit, he describes this kind of movement like, the, like the, the sprouting of a flower, where it starts as like a single bud uh, and eventually will grow into this flower. But he says that the flower isn't possible without that first bud, the first kind of uh, moment of its, of its possibility. So it's for that reason that we cannot discount these procedural steps through which we must go through, through, through which we must pass, in order to arrive at something new. And this newness always implies a shedding of what we were beforehand. So Butler in characterizing Benjamin's work a little bit more, says that there is presented here not a dyadic relation. So a dyadic relation is a relation between two separate things um, that have some engagement with one another, between like a self and another. Butler says that there is actually a triadic one. So there is a third kind of, uh, a third thing entering that relationship. So what is that? What is that third thing? Well, it might look like the therapist that is trying to kind of contain and control that encounter and so that one doesn't overtake the other, which is how, in, in many ways, um, therapy is conducted, especially when it happens between two people. The therapist acts as a kind of like mediator, right? The therapist is the person that is meant not to take sides, but to kind of reaffirm that relationship like in couples therapy or something to reaffirm that relationship or, or between like parents and kids or whatever so that there isn't 
like a side being taken so that both feel very secure and safe and essentially learn that it's no one's fault for what what happens or what has happened per se. So in this kind of triangulation that is between two poles and then a kind of exterior third pole that that constitutes that pole that reaffirms it, uh, Butler says that we are seeing a kind of revitalization of an Oedipal framework because we are seeing both of these initial poles kind of being frozen as though it's it's Oedipal, like it's always already there, like the heterosexual relation between the masculine, excuse me, masculine and the feminine. What we see here is a kind of freezing of, you know, the self and the other. And they're always in conflict. And this conflict is what like propels people to repress things because they can't act too excited lest they risk destroying the other and so on. So for Butler, a, a more radical project calls into question all of these kind of like frozen identities, you know, the ones that are frozen by these, these theories like Lacan, like the one that Benjamin puts forward here that maintains a sort of distance. Whereas for, for Butler, she wants to see a kind of Hegelian thing occurring that is conflict. But she wants this conflict to kind of explode the categories that we are used to, to open up new possibilities for us and for either of these two poles. So now she gets really problematic. Um, and I'm going to take her to task on this because it's, it's strangely problematic for her, um, not to mention the, the Evito Ronell thing. But that, you know, yeah, yeah. If you're not familiar, Google it and you'll see all about that. Um, or Avital Ronell. Anyways, here she says that trans people serve are, are kind of an example of that possibility. And it's difficult, so I want to extend an olive branch to her. And I want to recognize that it's difficult to say if this is something that she is like just thinking through, as it's just a, a fanciful thing she can just contemplate, or she's pointing to the limits of this idea and i you know i can't tell you how many times i read it i just couldn't understand and that was also part of the problem she was not clear enough about why she was mentioning this so she says that trans people she says of them that she associates them with a kind of ambiguity of sexual orientation so in her words it becomes difficult to say whether the sexuality of the trans person is homosexual or heterosexual, which is incredibly m messed up. And that, in my mind, it completely undoes kind of all of her seminal work. That is, you know, dispelling the illusion of, you know, sexual uh, destiny or biology as destiny. Here she just, she just reinscribes it. She says, people with penises who are trans, say they're trans women in this case, who knows what their sexual orientation is for her, which is totally it's wrong. Like, why does, why does she say that? So that was extremely annoying to read, and I can't let her get away with that. So if someone read it and they're like, no, 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 she was critiquing that perspective, then please explain it to me because I, I just don't, I didn't get that at all. But anyways, for her... Trans people trouble the kind of implicit association of sex and gender that we find in, like, the eatable paradigm. So, uh, I guess, this extends to what Benjamin says in that this is an example of something that completely undoes any smooth association between two separate poles. What we are seeing here is a kind of chiasmus. Chiasmus, yes. A chiasmus is when something kind of becomes its opposite and the opposite becomes it and it kind of reverses and folds in on itself and it takes on all these interesting new shapes and dimensions which is all well and good but there there's a problem here in that it romanticizes people whose bodies are you know constantly being used in kind of fetishistic ways so you see in the case of like trans bodies certain people you know fetishize that and then you have here Butler saying like, oh, wow, look at this potential. 
behind these bodies. Look at the potential that there is in these bodies, which for me is just a, you know, hop, skip, and a jump away from just all out fetishizing them. And here we go again with the kind of eatable thing emerging. But I'm, I'm being harsh. Maybe she deserves it. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the authority on this. So she kind of concludes this chapter by saying that, you know, what Benjamin does is interesting, but it fails to understand that in the act of recognition, in the moment of recognition, I should say, there is an, uh, there is an undoing occurring. You are always undone in the act of engaging with the other. And that is because our sense of self doesn't exist in isolation. You are not a self if you are alone. Despite what Descartes said, you know, Descartes, I think, therefore I am, where for Descartes, it's just a matter of sitting alone and thinking, and once you have stripped down everything within your mind, you are left only with the fact that you are thinking. You can then prove that you exist. Hegel, which is like, no, 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 no. Kant first was like, no, 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 no. That is not how this works. But anyways, I'm rambling. So then from here, chapter seven, quandaries of the incest taboo. All right, so this chapter. So the incest taboo is for psychoanalysis. That is, it is a condition for heterosexual kinship, which we should know by now. We should know. So this happens because the incest taboo forces the child to displace their love and desire for a parent onto another unrelated person or non, non-related person. So the son displaces his love for his mother onto another woman, and the same for a daughter, even though that's not nearly as developed. Now, what the psychoanalysts forget for Butler is that incest is a real thing. The idea that it's a taboo, a kind of natural taboo or cultural taboo that doesn't happen, is totally absurd. Like, it's something that happens, and it's an extremely traumatic thing. But... This, this trauma that is kind of, uh, that, that comes out of that, or comes from that, or that it produces, is for Butler so extreme that it might not even be accessible to the person. So because of this, Butler asks, what then is incest? And her question is this, is it an event that precedes a memory? Is it a memory that retroactively posits an event? Or is it a wish that takes the form of a memory? These are all really interesting questions because in the traumatic moment, and this is kind of like what um, uh, Catherine Malibu says in, in what is like unrepresentable about, you know, the, the traumatic events in like history. Like they are so traumatic that they cannot lend themselves to thought. And this is what happens in, in, in this, the trauma that is brought about in some cases through, through incest for Butler. So there's obviously a tension there within psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis posits this kind of like fantasy of incest. And, and then it is that fantasy through its being like controlled that it can then be displaced. But of course, that comes into conflict with the reality of the matter. And that is the fact that people actually engage in these horrible acts and do this upon people that are um, in many, many cases, non-consenting children. But, and this is where, you know, my, my channel is going to get banned, uh, Butler considers the way that um, in either framework, in either the kind of fantastical um, uh, appreciation of incest as, as allowing a kind of possibility for a healthy sexuation or a healthy socialization into sexuality, and on the other end of the spectrum, you know, the complete disavowal of it because of the harms it does for the trauma it can produce. What Butler says is that there is a kind of disavowal of, the, of a child or a person's autonomy in that act or in that desire. So we forget that, you know, the child is not a kind of unthinking being. Now, I'm, I'm going to add the big asterisk here that says, in all of these cases, these things are wrong. Full stop. Full stop. And I'm just humoring Butler here because there might be something to be said about it, but it should be never condoned. Simply enough. 
So the, the interesting thing that she asks, or well, she interrogates, is this. One, this is one of the interesting things. She says that incest relies, so the idea of incest relies upon a few axioms, that is a few principles. So some of these principles or kind of relationships are like the existence of a mother and a father, which culturally don't exist it's not a timeless idea. It's a very, it's a new idea that you know children are raised only by a mother and a father, and then they they kind of take on a symbolic or a kind of um, um, symbolic or kind of mystical character. So if we consider this, that is how the mother and father are necessary to um, socialize children through this kind of incest taboo relation, then we quickly run up against a wall. And this is something that uh, Gilles Deleuze and uh, Felix Guattari talk about in uh, Anti-Oedipus when they write that essentially the Oedipal paradigm, that is the Oedipus complex, when it comes down to its kind of bare bones original moment, what we are left with is a chicken and egg situation where apparently we need mothers and fathers, you know, to be the kind of site of an incest taboo. But mothers and fathers only exist once people have been kind of uh, indoctrinated through this incest taboo or have gone through the ringer of this incest taboo. So the kind of emphasis that psychoanalysis and other kind of sites have on the incest taboo, precisely because it is uh, kind of, it, it gravitates around the heterosexual couple, is that it forecloses, you know, gay, lesbian forms of parenting, for example, or, you know, um, yeah, I guess that it, so on and so forth, or more communal ones. But I don't want to, like, linger on this too much because I, I feel really icky talking about it. Um, so we'll move from there into Chapter 8, Bodily Confessions. So here, as the title of the chapter suggests, Bodily Confessions, she's going to pick up the work of Michel Foucault, specifically his work from the history of sexuality and some of his lectures. So she says here that she, or well, she, she takes from the idea of the confession in Foucault. So the confession in Foucault was kind of first de developed in the most kind of detail um, in the history of sexuality, volume one. Now, there are examples before that in like the birth of the clinic and, and madness in civilization where there is a, a desire to get the person to speak their illness to a doctor. This is more fully developed in the history of sexuality, volume one. So what is this all about? What is Foucault saying? Foucault says that the act of confessing isn't an act that kind of emancipates or brings out a new possibility for the person confessing. It is rather a way by which the person who is being confessed to, let's take a, a priest, for example, is actually having their power be uh, revitalized, be confirmed in the eyes of the person who is kind of turned into their subject, the person that they can then be put under their control, where the person who is being confessed to can say, you know, okay, you are forgiven or you are not. They hold a lot of power in that moment. So uh, additionally, you know, not just in the case of like a priest and a person being uh, confessing to the priest, psychoanalysis uses this principle to kind of mandate and control the person confessing. Okay, so this is the Foucault that Butler presents first and says, Foucault is very critical of the confession because it, it, you know, it is a way to kind of affirm power. She then says that in the later Foucault, following the history of sexuality, she says that Foucault does a kind of auto-critique, that is, he critiques himself after he, he had read the work of uh, Seneca, where apparently he found an example where the act of speaking, or the act of confessing, does not simply reinscribe the authority of the person being spoken to, is it, it is instead how, uh, and here's a quote, the self constitutes itself in discourse with the assistance of another's presence and speech. So here there's a kind of, Butler kind of calls this a moment of self-sacrifice. And keeping in with the kind of timbre of the book, 
a kind of self undoing. So there's a kind of self-sacrifice here where in the act of being constituted by an other, the person you are speaking to, uh, one must essentially shed their previous self. So this happens in this moment, this encounter, through verbalization. So through the act of speaking. So in speaking, you open yourself up to new possibility. So it's not so simple, simple as by speaking, you are confirming a power that is controlling you. Here we see a Foucault, and this is something that Butler's picking up on. We see a, a Foucault that is kind of celebrating the act of speaking as it opens up a kind of possibility. Now, Foucault talks about this a little bit in uh, Madness and Civilization. So there is in that book about a third the way through or something. He kind of applauds something that Freud did. So Freud, you know, being kind of, quote-unquote, father of psychoanalysis, Freud made it so that the patient could speak. Whereas before that, you know, it was just a kind of medical gaze that said, oh, you have this wrong with you, either we will, you know, banish you, we're gonna might, we might put you on display for people to laugh and throw rocks at you, or we'll just shove you in a kind of dungeon somewhere and hide you away. So he, he celebrates Freud because Freud actually listened to these people and didn't just tell them what was, you know, wrong with them. So we get this a little bit even in his earlier writings, but that's, you know, that's just me spouting things. So now, okay, fine. Having accepted this, Butler asks, is it possible then to reconsider psychoanalysis in these terms? So not as being the reinscription of a kind of powerful... Uh, a person being confessed to, the analyst, the analyst, uh, but actually seeing a kind of potential in the psychoanalytic moment where, you know, there is a person talking about themselves, talking about what goes on in their mind to someone else. Might there be a possibility there of a kind of undoing and by virtue of that, a kind of new becoming into something, something other? And she says, yes. But we must do something to make that happen. Where she says that in a lot of cases, psychoanalysis is really focused on what is said. So, in what is said, there is revealed kind of what one's intentions are. Behind the words that are said, there might be a way to kind of peek, or through the words, there might be a way to peek at the person's like real desire, kind of real, uh, you know, the things that are making them, or screwing them up, so to speak. So for Butler, as long as we focus on that aspect, that is, we focus on the content of what is said, we are going to be doomed to reproduce this cycle of power because then it'll always come down to repression. And this is always a repression that's kind of identified from the outside, a repression that disavows the person speaking. So what we must do instead, or on the other hand, if we were to focus simply on the fact that the psychoanalytic encounter opens up the possibility of verbalization, that is of speech, we are presented with a much more exciting encounter. Now, I have to be totally honest, at this point, I, I, get, I got really confused as to where she was going with this. So it, it made sense to me, like, okay, let's focus on the act of speaking rather than what is said. But then it seems as though, and this is my best shot here, it seems as though she wants to dissociate the person being confessed to, that is, in the psychoanalytic case, the analyst, wants the analyst to be dissociated from a person that is going to, like, administer punishment or pain, the same with, like, the priest, and instead to kind of foster a more, maybe, a holistic, a more caring encounter between the two. So Butler emphasizes, though, um, speech because of its kind of embodied character. So in the act of speaking, and it, it's really interesting, uh, it comes forth from, for her, a kind of body that is committed, that has committed a deed or an act that is in need of absolution, that is in need of kind of forgiveness. So what this does is it, it reveals that the change promoted by verbalization has real kind of bodily consequences. Where the person speaking, uh, if we just reduce it to the words, then it's kind of abstracted. 
you know, what is said is abstracted, and we lose the sight of the we lose sight of the fact that there is a body behind it, and anything that the body is saying, the mouth is saying, is the sight of the kind of shame that was felt beforehand. So, in the case of excuse my cat making noise, um, in the case of a person, let's say, going to church who had committed a sin, it is always the body that commits that sin. So, in the act of speaking, in the act of confessing, what we are revealing is the extent to which the person undergoes a kind of change because their body, in the act of speaking, is kind of atoning, atonement, atoning, atoning for their sins. Wow, okay. Atoning for their sins, um, which throws everything out of whack. Yeah, there we go. Great. Good job, David. Wow. Uh, all right. Chapter nine. I'm sorry about that. That was weak. That was weak. My brain's not going well. Uh, chapter nine, the end of sexual difference. So before I jump into this chapter, I want to read something that she says that kind of captures the essence of this book. And this happens a little bit later on in the book, but it's, it's, it's really germane for what we're going to get into here. Um, so it, I think the argument goes something like this, and these are her words. We must maintain the framework of sexual difference because it brings to the fore the continuing culture, cultural and political reality of patriarchal domination because it reminds us that wherever permutations of gender take place, they do not fully challenge the framework within which they take place, for that framework persists at a symbolic level that is more difficult to intervene upon. So this kind of sets the stage for her perspective in that she sees a kind of importance to maintaining sexual difference, but not all feminists agree. And there are, you know, big debates about this, especially now, Um, you know, considering the uh, real strong, um, I guess, place of of queer studies within uh, feminist uh, circles or feminist uh, departments, you know, with the emergence of gender studies in lieu of kind of in place of feminism and women's studies. So Butler, being the good kind of Hegelian as she she is, celebrates the differences among feminists and says, you know, it is important that we have these varying and differing perspectives and that it's wrong to silence people. It's wrong to kind of say, you know, anyone's, uh, anyone is uh, kind of prima facie that is right off the bat wrong. Um, so she asks and said, how, how, how should we best have these di- kinds of disagreements and how most productively can we stage them and how to, can we act in ways that acknowledge the irreversible complexity of who we are? So, you know, she takes on a kind of like cosmopolitanism here, you know, she's like a cool liberal, like, oh, you know, we have to accept all differences and we have to be prepared to listen to other people, like a real Hegelian in this way. Um, but nah, nah. there are some just within feminist circles there are a lot of really problematic feminists that you know maybe uh we or most importantly you know women of color or non-binary people of color trans people shouldn't have to like tolerate listening to to some of that stuff but anyways this is it's her book it's her opinion um So what she does then here is look at three things that feminism across the board is is interested in. And these three things are sexual difference, gender, and sexuality. So and she doesn't just want to say that these exist, right, Uh, because for some feminists they are real. She wants to understand what these terms do. So she's not going to like take sides and be like, oh, you know, gender's a, you know, a construct, which she does say uh but here she's more interested in asking what these terms do in a kind of feminist matrix of speaking matrix of speaking i'm just yeah all right i'm going to continue here so she highlights two very disparate polls she says that both queer theorists and the conservative minded vatican you know like Pope Land, have they share a view of sexual difference, where they both want to do away with gender to locate primary 
kind of sexuality within sex and sexuality. So, I guess, among the queer community, they want to, and this is very broad brush, very broad brush, but this is what she says. The queer community for her wants to liberate people from the confines of gender, and the latter, that is the Vatican, wants a kind of biology as destiny. So, it's about reducing things to the body. And for those to return to Foucault once again, at the end of the History of Sexuality, Volume 1, he says essentially that. He's like, we have to move away from sex and sexuality and focus instead on bodies and pleasure. Like, he's he, he's saying like, yeah, if we just get, you know, through all the kind of cultural stuff and get to what lies underneath the kind of bedrock of the human, then we can, you know, really engage in pleasure. But, you know, the pro- proper post-structuralist I am, my hands fly up and I say, well, wh- what does that look like? How can you have this bedrock that isn't always already constituted by the things that, that, that exist on top of it? You know, the things that we take as being cultural and malleable and changing. But anyways, that's my r- rambling. So we have the Vatican and we have queer theorists that are essentially arguing for the same thing. But of course, they're for very different reasons. So she says that what this does is it really reveals um, the kind of complexity of any approach to gender. And that because we aren't really going to be able to agree, our task is to confront, in her words, the permanent difficulty of determining where the biological, the psychic, the discursive, and the, so- and the social begin and end. So, how does, that, how does that apply? If we take a sexual difference, it might be assumed from the outside that sexual difference is about uh, the binary between men and women. Whereas for Butler, it is not that at all. What is interesting for Butler is the very um, kind of binary that is implied in the idea of sexual difference, in the kind of truthfulness of it. So either we have sexual difference as biology or we have it as, you know, totally cultural. And that is what is interesting for Butler. And if we just kind of engage or, or kind of give ourselves over to one of those sides, that is the side that says it's natural, the side that says it's cultural, then we are, we are doomed. And we have to do more of, we have to take a step back and look at the kind of bigger picture of what is going on here with something like sexual difference. And that ultimately for her, we have to leave the problem of sexual difference unresolved, lest we kind of, you know, foreclose a certain possibility. And that's a scary word, possibility, because we get into Deleuzean territory and Guattarian territory here. So let me explain what the hell that means before you, ju- you shut this off. When we're talking about the idea of possibility or what takes on the, the kind of moniker of becoming, so to become, the verb, you know the verb, to become, uh, devenir in French, I guess. Devenue? Anyways. Um, when we're talking about that in terms of Deleuze and Guattari, what we're talking about is a kind of endless possibility. And really, I think you can get away with just thinking this in the simplest terms possible as having the door open for different possibilities in terms of gender, in terms of sex, in terms of class, in terms of race, anything. Just new possibilities, just anything. Let it, let it fly, let it go. Now, Butler doesn't engage really directly with Deleuze and Guattari here. Instead, she looks through the work of um, a woman who's, uh, she's um, Dutch, I think, um, uh, who does a lot of work in like post-humanism, and that's Rosie Bredodi. Specifically, her book titled Metamorphoses, where there is in this book... Um, a kind of version of a non-gendered sexual difference that is open to endless revision through becoming. So if we can move beyond, for Braid Odie that is, if we can move beyond gender, we can open up the door to whole new possibilities, which is very exciting. And it troubles and it disturbs the kind of oppressive frameworks in which we are housed. Butler has a problem with this though. Because she is not so fond of just newness qua newness. That is, 
to just open the door to any and, and possibility to disturb the confines of the uh, situation we are in now. And this is something that she makes very clear as early as her book, Gender Trouble, where she says that there is plenty of resistance happening, you know, in things like drag. You know, drag is a place, um, like the drag race, is a place where all of our ideas about gender and sexuality are turned on their head. And that is enough, in some cases, for Butler. If we are to just celebrate difference, qua difference, so difference just for the sake of difference, Butler doesn't find that really exciting because it's almost like too easy. Like, sure, throw anything you want in, into a blender and you can come out with something at the end, but it's not necessarily something that's very appetizing. That's what a weird analogy. I don't know why I thought of that. But anyways, okay, so she does not consider herself a very good materialist. What the hell does that mean, David? For her... And this should, you know, it probably makes sense. She's really interested in culture, in signification, things that aren't like bodily, you know. She's interested in like gender, which isn't like bodily. No, nothing about our bodies kind of position us for a gender. You know, gender comes from culture, it comes from society. So she's not interested in a kind of like materialism that, that kind of, puts the body toward new possibilities. Sorry for that beep. So the be beep, yeah, all right, sorry. Uh, and she also sees in Deleuze and in Bray a fear of the negative. So in Deleuze, it's like endless possibility. Everything's all good. We can go everywhere and, and do anything, which isn't entirely true, but this is how, so this is kind of how Bray Doty reads um, Deleuze. And in, in my mind, it's, it's a little bit naive, like, Deleuze isn't as positive a thinker as um, Bray Doty likes to think, or someone like Andrew Culp likes to think in some in some cases. Uh, but there is that kind of... Uh, I digress. Okay, so, Butler doesn't see herself as a good Deleuzean. She finds herself disagreeing. She likes Deleuze, but she has some problems with it, because she is more a thinker of the negative. She wants to confront things that don't make sense and that we cannot necessarily subscribe to. And it is simply by virtue of that that she gets excited. She's like, oh, let me encounter the thing that I cannot actually change into. I cannot become so that I can, you know, trouble everything I know about myself. And you don't necessarily know what change that is going to make within yourself, but you know it will be some change. And that propels us here into chapter 10 titled The Question of Social Transformation. So what is transformation, social transformation? Well, she kind of meditates on the distinction that is often made between theory and praxis, between theory and practice, where she says that theory is itself a kind of practice and that it's impossible to have a practice without having a theory that came before. Like no one just acts impulsively uh, and, and motivates a kind of social transformation. People stand for something that they are aware of in their minds that is something that they've accepted through thought, through theory, through theorization, and then that opens a possibility for social transformation. But, you know, you can't have that with just theory alone, but it is totally necessary. Now, she says that, you know, um, feminism is a theoretical and philosophical enterprise because it is always asking questions about, you know, what makes a life good, what makes a life livable, what makes, you know, uh, what allows for the good life, um, which are all, you know, philosophical questions historically. And essentially it does this by asking how gender constrains or enhances life, you know. So by questioning gender, it's essentially opening up the possibility for possibility for newness for uh, change and so you know in keeping with her work from gender trouble she sees a sort of possibility of social transformation in things like drag where she sees it as being fundamentally political now this is something that she was very uh, she identifies as being a kind of point of contention because some critics have been like hey you're really putting these people up on a pedestal that is people doing drag and you're really diminishing what like politics is 
which is obviously a problematic view. And so she kind of entertains that for a minute where she wants to contextualize that her position uh, is, or she contextualizes her position by recalling her youth as someone who read Hegel during the day and attended gay bars at night in that she, she was living this life. Um, and that she still believes that drag troubles the essentialism believed of gender. So there is within that a kind of resistive political act. And, it, you know, it, it throws a wrench in what we know to be normal. And by virtue of that, it troubles, you know, the power-knowledge divide or the kind of power-knowledge dynamic that motivates normalization, motivates normativity. And, and, and drag opens up by, by challenging those sites new spaces to challenge racism, sexism, and homophobia. And this opens up the possibility to recognize more people as human, you know, to expand the category of the human, to provide spaces for people that have been undone by this oppressive regime, this oppressive world, to allow them a space where they can feel like they belong and they can feel like they are, you know, wanted and needed and respected, you know, very necessary things that, you know, people thrive with. But of course, we shouldn't just kind of absentmindedly prescribe this this human identity, you know, to solve all our problems, because the idea of the human has a pretty rough past, and it does imply a lot of exclusion, right? So if we say, you know, we have this criterion of the human, and we try to extend it to include other people, as long as we are working within the parameters of an idea of the human like that, we are going to foreclose those non-normative bodies that do not fit within it. So for her, she, she does want to expand that category of the human, but she says that it's always going to be up for uh, renewal. It's always going to be completely revisited, revised to include other people and that we cannot ever be satisfied with a kind of single definition. And it's here that she turns to the work of Gloria, Gloria Anzaldúa. And her book, um, Borderlands uh, slash La Frontera, La Frontera. I don't, I don't have any Spanish, so that's how I pronounce it. I guess it's French today. Um, and this is a, a very important book, and I intend, I'd like to do it on here one day. But in this book, Anzel Dua kind of recounts her experience living on the borderlands between you know, Mexico and the United States, where she was navigating these two identities and how she always felt like she was in between both of these identities. And it was by virtue of that that she, you know, her the idea of herself as a human was contested. It was constantly being re re um, kind of challenged. It had to be revitalized and renewed through all these different lenses that, you know, there wasn't really a language for before she came along and, and did this. So it was a really seminal piece, um, and uh, yeah, so Butler takes it up to say this. So I'll read a little section here. Anzel Dua asks us to consider that the source of our capacity for social transformation is to be found precisely in our capacity to mediate between worlds, to engage in cultural translation, and to undergo, through the experience of language and community, the diverse set of cultural connections that make us who we are. So I'll keep going here. So one could say that for her, the subject is multiple rather than unitary, and that, and that would be to get the point in a way. But I think her point is more radical. She is asking us to stay at the edge of what we know, to put our own epistemological certainties into question, and through that, risk and openness to another way of knowing and of living in the world to expand our capacity to imagine the human. So there is, you know, it, and it isn't like deliberate. It isn't like, yeah, let us constantly challenge this idea of the human and let's sit in a room and do that. Just by virtue of Ansel Dua existing in between worlds, in between the United States and Mexico, where so much of what we consider to be human is predicated upon a, a national identity, um, she is, reveals that and shows that when these things are questioned, when we exist outside of the comfort of either zone, our idea of ourselves is heavily called into question. So she then turns from Ansel Dua to look at Gayatri Spivak's idea of the fractured subject. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of correlate to the idea of Ansel Dua's multiple subject that I just read there. But, but it's different. Like these, these are two very different theories, but Butler is presenting both to say like, hey, 
we have these at least these two different perspectives that really contest this idea of the human and we have to take them very seriously if we want to move forward with a you know an effective uh humanitarian project because they both reveal and this is me using uh angela davis's language they, they both reveal that this kind of struggle for the human is a, is a constant struggle like for her it's freedom you know is a constant struggle uh here the idea of the human has to always be struggled against or with and that puts us here into our final chapter chapter 11 titled uh can the other in quotes of philosophy speak now this chapter is really like a review of how butler got into philosophy where she talks about how she found you know copies of spinoza and leibniz and hegel and stuff and was just reading that when at a very young age uh, and she just went from there so th there's a lot of those details that aren't all that important to mention but you know we'll get into it here so here she highlights the crisis undergone in philosophy with the introduction of kind of um of myriad new perspectives from new people that so many philosophers lament. So this is just kind of the basis for interdisciplinarity where, you know, you have feminism coming into philosophy, you have critical race studies coming into philosophy, you have, you know, even like the white, white ass field of postmodernism coming into philosophy. For philosophers, this is a problem because it's kind of tainting the, um, the purity of what philosophy is. Now, this is incredibly ironic for Butler because philosophy is the thinking of newness. Like, it has always been that. It, is, it has always been, at least since Aristotle. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this was Plato so much. But with Aristotle, it is the thinking of kind of new possibilities, you know, and onward. So she says then it's kind of ironic that there's such a pushback or kind of reaction among philosophers against these new perspectives entering the field so then it's here she kind of recounts her own foray her own entry into philosophy through spinoza kierkegaard schopenhauer and also through her courses at the uh, synagogue uh, where she was fascinated by questions of human responsibility god and, and so on so after traversing a number of different philosophical paths, Butler found solace in Hegel and his philosophy of recognition, which we've already explained. Um, and for her, you know, this is kind of her plea for us to embrace Hegel, where she says, like, should not philosophy embrace Hegel and accept its recognition of and by the other of philosophy? So Kant and Hegel being taught in English departments, for example, like that's should be happening. Um and so, so many more examples before pure like interdisciplinarity is accepted uh, because philosophy exists everywhere. You know, it's a site for new and interesting things and we're, we do it every day. Like every time we ask ourselves, do I like my life? Do I want my life to be different? Do I want my life to be better? Why do I have a life? You know, and so on. You are doing philosophy and that's something we are always kind of engaged in but yeah that's more or less how it ends <laughs> this i will say this book really annoyed me because it's you know it's a collection of essays which is already difficult in itself because there's no kind of real coherent thread that binds them all together but even some of the individual essays were just bad like she, she wouldn't complete ideas new and random things would come to her mind. She'd then talk about that for a paragraph and then go on to something else. Like it really felt like at this point she was just like throwing words on a page with some of these essays. Not, not all of them, but some of them were definitely annoying. So yeah, that's my, there, my two cents. Um, but yeah, so if you listen this far, thank you. Um, and let me know if I did anything wrong or incorrect or anything. See you next time.